Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Lieutenant Jeff Cheshire from the Speedway Fire Department. You're listening to the SA Matters radio show with Dr. Rich Gasaway. SA Matters' mission is simple. They want to help us see bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. Hello and welcome to episode 58 of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple to help us see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from Lodi, California, where I'm in town to deliver a one day mental management of emergencies program designed to improve situational awareness and decision making under stress. This is the ninth SA Matters tour stop delivered in California in 2015 thus far. Thanks to the departments and associations that have hosted the programs here and throughout the U.S. and Canada, your support of the mission is very appreciated. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about one of the more challenging situational awareness barriers, mission myopia. But before I do that, let's refresh on what situational awareness is and what a barrier is and how I uncovered the barriers that I talk about on the podcast and in the blog and in the live programs. Situational awareness is your ability to perceive and understand What is happening in the environment around you, in the context of how time is passing, and then in turn being able to make accurate predictions of future events and time to avoid bad outcomes. In the Mental Management of Emergencies program, I talk extensively about the process of how situational awareness is formed. We break down what it means to have perception and how it is that the brain forms understanding, and how we use intuition to help us guide our decision-making, and how we predict future events. It all seems so simple on the surface, and maybe it would be if it weren't for these pesky little things called barriers. Barriers are anything that, that impacts situational awareness, anything that keeps us from being able to perceive and understand and be able to predict the future. When I started doing my research on situational awareness barriers, I was naive to believe that there might be 15 or 20 situational awareness barriers. When in fact, when the dust settled after my research, there were over 115 situational awareness barriers. The one we're gonna talk about today is mission myopia. Mission Myopia, a barrier to situational awareness. The tones drop for an apartment building fire. On the way, dispatch is advising of multiple calls, confirming a working fire and the possibility of people trapped. The mind of the officer on the aerial platform is busy processing, thinking, anticipating. What will be our needs upon our arrival? Of course, truck work is on the officer's mind. Forcible entry, search and rescue, ventilation. The officer takes a deep breath and smiles. It's going to be a good day. The pre-arrival lens. The pre-arrival lens is the visual image formed on the officer's mind about what is going to be seen on arrival. The lens helps the officer to anticipate and plan. The lens can also help the officer mentally prepare for the worst case scenario. On a side note, when I was a young firefighter, a seasoned officer told me that I should envision the worst case scenario and then hope for the best case scenario. What I envisioned in my mind was the pre-arrival lens, my understanding of what I could expect when I got there. 
goal setting. The pre-arrival lens can help a responding officer do some goal setting before they arrive at the scene. This can be both an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is that the goal can be set and a plan can be communicated to the crews so that everyone can mentally prepare for the task. The disadvantage is that the plan may not fit the conditions once the crew arrives. Set in stone. Plans can be easy to make and hard to change. Once set in motion, either mentally or physically, it can be difficult to change a course of action or to stop a plan. It is much easier to implement a plan without conducting an assessment to determine if the conditions actually justify and support the plan. Blinded. Here are some questions I posed recently during a program in which we were discussing flawed situational awareness. Is it possible that an officer could be so focused on the mission that dangerous conditions would go unnoticed? Is it possible that an officer could be so focused on a mission that dangerous conditions would be noticed, but the officer would not understand or comprehend how bad the conditions actually are? Is it possible that an officer could be so committed to the mission that dangerous conditions get noticed and the dangerous conditions are understood, yet the officer chooses to completely ignore the conditions because he or she is committed to the mission. Following a discussion of all the ways mission myopia can flaw situational awareness, I showed the students a video clip. In the clip, a crew of firefighters were performing a highly risky vertical ventilation operation while adjacent to where they were working the fire had most evidently burned through the roof and massive amounts of fire and smoke were billowing out of the hole and the exclamation point was put on the lesson what were those firefighters doing on the roof what was their mission were they assuming a risk or creating risk by being there? Were they doing anything that was going to make the situation better? Begin with the end in mind. When setting a goal to accomplish at an incident scene, ask yourself, if we are able to successfully complete this goal, how will the outcome of the incident be improved? Do we have the right resources here and now to successfully accomplish the goal. How much time do we have to accomplish the goal before the fire overruns us or structural integrity becomes compromised? What will be the clues and the cues that would serve as indicators that it is time for us to abandon the goal? Do we have a viable plan for extricating ourselves from the situation if the conditions take a turn for the worse. Asking these tough questions in advance of engaging can help you make a realistic assessment of the risk that you are taking and help you anticipate potentially bad outcomes before they happen. Discuss a time when you observed mission myopia and the risk that resulted from what happened. Discuss actions you can take to avoid mission myopia. Discuss strategies for what you could or should do if you observe someone else displaying mission myopia at an incident scene. Okay, before we close out today's episode, let's review a near miss. This one from the National Near Miss Reporting System. I always put a link to the Near Miss Reporting System at the bottom of every episode's player page because of the valuable lessons that it contains related to situational awareness. Cardiac arrest quickly becomes a carbon monoxide incident. At approximately 2300 hours on February 5th, 2015, Units were alerted to a cardiac arrest. Responding units, including an engine with three, a BLS ambulance with two, an ALS unit with one, 
another ALS unit with one, and a battalion chief. The printed dispatch information indicated the subject was found unresponsive in a garage with a running car. Given this information, the crew started the foregas monitor during the response. However, on arrival, the crew found the patient was in cardiac arrest outside of an open garage with no running car. During CPR, a nonspecific odor was noticed, but no reading was measured on the foregas monitor, measuring LEL, O2, CO2, and H2S that was positioned just outside the garage. An investigation of the interior immediately after revealed approximately 300 parts per million of carbon monoxide at the doorway between the house and the garage. Additional equipment was requested for assistance in ventilation. Entry was made with full PPE and SCBA with a four gas and thermal imaging camera. Natural gas was secured to the structure. All possible sources of CO were evaluated on the interior. Cooking equipment, fireplaces, water heater, dryer, and HVAC. A consistent 300 to 400 parts per million of CO was found throughout the house. No abnormal readings on any other sensors. The structure was systematically ventilated from the basement to the second floor with the aid of two PPV fans. Once the structure was cleared during a recheck, the garage was entered and approximately 200 parts per million CO was found with all the doors closed. The tick found no abnormal heating of either the vehicle in the garage beyond the ambient temperature, the hood, the front, the tailpipe, and exhaust. A secondary look at one of the cars revealed a higher temperature in the front wheel well indicating a hotter motor. Further investigation led to opening a door on the car. The reading at the edge of the car door overloaded the foregas monitor, meaning greater than 1,000 parts per million. Lessons learned. Trust your instincts. The immediate recognition that this could be an event related to carbon monoxide led to the initial decision making on the incident scene and likely saved a lot of time. 2. Search for an answer. Without any reasonable carbon monoxide source inside the structure, the crew returned to the garage, which seemed to be the only other option. Determining that a car had been running, possibly for an extended period of time, would have explained the high levels of carbon monoxide throughout the house and extremely high levels in the closed car. 3. Think broader than dispatch. Had the crew simply treated this as a cardiac arrest and nothing more, it's possible they would have never found the carbon monoxide inside the house. This could be used in patient treatment as well as preventing further injury illness to anyone else who entered the house. The use of a single gas carbon monoxide monitor on the EMS bag could have been essential for this incident. The AMS equipment was placed just inside the garage where there was lighting. Had this incident been inside the garage or inside the house, the personnel could have been exposed to 300 plus parts per million of carbon monoxide for an extended period of time without knowledge. If a foregas or other type of gas monitoring equipment had not been used, the responding crew may have never known. This time of year, houses are heated with multiple fuel sources and also well sealed due to colder weather. These both lead to an increased number of carbon monoxide related incidents, but many are never identified as such because no gas monitoring equipment is used or is available. 
The use of a single gas point of contact carbon monoxide monitor could have rapidly identified and alerted the personnel to the danger. They knew the level of CO was greater than 1,000 parts per million inside the car and due to the rate to which the level increased, it was likely to be much higher. To learn more about this near miss and others like it, visit the National Near Miss Reporting System. The link is in the show notes. Before we close out this episode, I want to take a moment to thank those organizations who've recently hosted situational awareness programs. Your support of the mission is greatly appreciated. The Alabama Fire College and the Battalion 1 of Shelby County hosted a full-day program in Alabaster, Alabama, and I thank you for all the wonderful hospitality I received there. The Frisco Fire Department of Frisco, Texas, hosted a two-day event of situational awareness, and thank you for hosting and, again, for the wonderful hospitality. Some upcoming events, I'm in Lodi, California today, June 1, and then I'll be at the Illinois Fire Service Institute um, June 4 through 7, the Montana Joint Conference June 10 and 11, uh, the Prince Albert Fire Department in Saskatchewan June 16th, the South Dakota Firefighters Association June 18, 19, 20, the Spokane Fire Department June 22nd, Flathead County EMS uh, June 26 and 27. If you're interested in attending one of the live events, just head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side that says Upcoming Events. Well, that's it. Episode 58 is complete. Thank you to our sponsor, Midwest Fire, and thank you to the listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I certainly appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. If you've experienced or witnessed a near miss and would like to be uh, share your story on this platform and your lessons learned with others, please contact me by visiting the samatters.com site and clicking on the Contact Us link on the homepage. It gets, uh, it's a really, really valuable way to share your experiences and to help others. And uh, we've got some fabulous guests that we have uh, had on the show and, and some that are lined up. Um, join in and be part of the conversation and share what you're learning. If you like the show, please go over to iTunes and Stitcher Radio and consider subscribing. Search for SA Matters Radio. SA Matters Radio. And uh, please consider leaving your feedback there. And if you like the show, leave a five star review. Not only does that motivate me, but it'll also help others to find the show too. Be safe out there. And may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.